Welcome to the Recycle Podcast, where we discuss everyday issues from a mental health perspective. We are your hosts, Dr. LaFanya Jones, Dr. Rashonda Strickland, and Dr. Nichelle Wall. Now don't get it twisted. We're not going to be your stereotypical therapist. What we will be is down to earth, informative, a little spicy, and vulnerable. All right, interns, turn up the volume, grab your pen and paper. It's supervision time. As a reminder, this podcast is not meant to take the place of a relationship with a licensed mental health professional. Welcome back and thanks for tuning in to session one, The Juggling Act. Today, we're going to discuss stress management, and we decided to start with this topic because of everything that's going on in the world. We feel like people are definitely experiencing some stress, and we feel like we need to bring some information to you all to help you get through this time that is so crucial for all of us. So what we would like to start off with is just kind of talking about how stress affects us all differently. The difficulty is that people are stressed by several things, but we can't really pinpoint what the main stressor is. So it just kind of feels like we're just overwhelmed and all over the place. So ladies, I would like to pose a question to you all. What do you think one of the main stressors right now today is? If I had to pick, it definitely would be uh, coronavirus, you know, with all of the new re-shutdowns and some of the the new mask protocols mm-hmm. and yeah. people continuing to lose their jobs because of it. You know, it's really affecting all of us in mm-hmm. a, a way that is unusual mm-hmm. for our time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would also say, you know, the different things that are going on in our country, United States, for anybody watching abroad, We are struggling as a country and it is hard to continuously watch the videos that are being filmed and see different injustices done. So it, our psyche, our bodies are having a reaction to that. And the thing is, I agree with both of you ladies. COVID-19 has definitely caused a lot of us to feel fearful and Mm -hmm. powerless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that causes stress in itself. Yeah. We, we leave ourselves feeling very vulnerable and it, it prevents us from being able to be effective in the world. Actually, it, it, it prevents us from being effective at our jobs as a parent, as a friend, as a spouse. It just, it prevents us from being effective period. And what we have to understand is that a lot of us now are working in a position that we don't know if we're going to come home to a job. I mean, uh, not come home to a job. (laughs) Sorry. No, go out and get to our job and be able to have a job when we get there, because we don't know how our job has been affected by. We don't know if someone has been diagnosed positively Mm -hmm. and now everybody has to go home. Uh, there, I, I, just as Dr. Strickland was saying, restaurants have been closed down, reclosed because someone was positive at mm-hmm. their, at a restaurant. And that affects people's jobs, which also then increases unemployment. Yeah. The isolation as well has been a major factor for a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I agree with that. And then even as Dr. Wall was saying with the anti-racism protest and, all of those things that we've been silently suffering for for decades, that has also taken a toll on us. We have now shifted from men being more stressed out to women being more stressed out. Women have now begun to work outside of the home. And we've also um, started receiving higher education. So now we're receiving higher education, which means we're also receiving more demanding jobs and we are still wives and mothers and we have all of those hats. And now on top of that, we have to worry about whether or not our family is going to be sick. We have to worry about whether or not our businesses will be closed down. One of the things that I can admit to for myself personally is that Dr. Strickland and I, we opened Balance Beacon four years ago and we have 
struggled, <laughs> struggled <laughs> a lot to get to where we are right now yeah. to as a thriving uh, private practice, providing mental health to the community. And for us to feel like we our company was threatened to have to shut down initially, that was very scary. It was very mm-hmm. stressful. We already had to go through the stress of opening <laughs> a, a practice oh and goodness. quitting our jobs, you know? Well, that's a whole podcast in itself. <laughs> Ain't it, it is. It is. <laughs> it is. To step out on faith. Yes. Because it definitely was a faith step because initially we both quit our jobs and that was stressful. And then we started the practice and we start, we f- figured out we had to start back working, uh, at another job until our practice built up. And, and then when it finally built up, we were able to leave those jobs and work here full time, but it's still stressful. And we had to lean on each other in order to be able to get through that stress. There were several days. One of us would be like, okay, yeah, we're going to have to shut it down. And you know what? I want to kind of piggyback and jump on something that you said. And I'm, I'm assuming that all three of us have felt this at some point. There's a combination of what we call you stress and distress yes. in, in a situation like that. So for those that are unfamiliar with the term you stress, um, a different way of saying that would be good stress. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you have distress, which is of course what we all typically think of when we hear the word stress and starting here, And even now for what everybody is going through, you know, with coronavirus and all of the protesting and everything, we're stuck with this combination of good stress and bad stress. So we have the things that we're excited about. So just kind of going with your example there Mm -hmm. of, you know, opening a private practice and starting and all of the excitement of picking out the furniture and the colors and the, and getting the name and the logo and all of that stuff. stuff. And then talking and meeting (laughs) together, you know, all of us as a a finally together as a staff, Mm -hmm. that's all great stresses to have. But then you also have the combination of distress, which, which, you know, puts you in this weird tug of war situation Mm -hmm. of, okay, but I'm also leaving my job because all of us left our jobs. You know, Dr. Jones and I left ours, Dr wall left hers and then um and then our biller collector as well as our uh, front office staff we all left our jobs collectively at the same time Mm -hmm. to come here and get this started so there's this excitement level and this (laughs) oh my god we really (laughs) did this what did i just do (laughs) thing going on yeah um so that's something i kind of wanted to highlight that i I think a lot of people are experiencing that now Mm -hmm. as well because there are things still going on in your life because like the old saying goes you know life goes on so there are people yeah. are having babies getting married yeah. and they're having all of these good moments but on top of that there's this weird kind of cloud hanging over yeah. everything well i would even have to say those that are you said married people are getting married people can't even get married like they have wedding dates right now yeah. mm-hmm. and have to cancel them because of not the social distancing that we are having to experience and experience even funerals. People can't even bury their loved Virtual. ones. Yeah. Yes, because of the coronavirus. And so these are very stressful times for all of us. And, and it's definitely one of those things that it almost seems like there's nothing you can do about it. Like I said, it's po- you feel powerless. Yeah. Yeah. I think something that you said, Dr. Wall, was also important was isolation. Yeah. You know, I think you both make a valid point with all of that. You know, when you're talking about people are not able to go to funerals and express their grief with their loved ones because of this isolation Mm -hmm. and quarantine that we're all having to go through. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's a different experience of not being able to share in the collective. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think another component of that stress is the grief there's a a grieving of what was and a grieving of it more than likely is not ever going to come back like the world as we know it is always going to be different and I know all of us can attest to this when we're seeing our clients that's a major thing that they talk about they Mm -hmm. are really struggling as well as we are with what is the new normal going to be and am I going to be okay with it and you know the other I believe 
difficulty for the three of us is that because of the anti-racism and the difficulties we're having in the United States in that sector, we're all African-American women. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And we have to suffer in silence and not that we don't have each other to lean on, to talk to about everything that we may be feeling or thinking and things like that. But that's still difficult because you still have to go in and suppress what we're feeling to adjust to what we need to hear and be and be for our clients. Yeah, you there's no room in therapy as a therapist to have your stuff in the middle of someone else's session. You definitely have to have yourself together. And that's like psychology one on one. You yes. cannot be given yes. psychology yes. anything to someone when you're not okay. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a uh something that a, a lot of people are not aware of yeah. when they are coming to therapy initially that you know we have to be essentially a blank slate you know there's really nothing there that you're really supposed to get from us other than you know the support and education Mm -hmm. and um, assistance that you need Uh, so it's great to be able to have a, a group of people that understand what you're going through Yes. You know, I can only imagine for mental health professionals that are in a practice by themselves. Yes. Yeah. They're 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 alone in this uh, as in, unless they have an outside, you know, group of people or other cuz I believe if you're practicing alone, no one understands you other than another mental health professional because we have to give of ourselves while people are and I'm going to say this because I tell my clients that this is what I would like for them to do it while they're dumping their stuff in my office. I want them to use my office as a trash can to dump all of their stress. But when you have it on your own, when mm-hmm. you're in private practice on your own, if you don't have a group yeah. of professionals that you can uh, rely on mm-hmm. you, I mean like you're doing that on your own. Definitely. And that's one thing that I, that's why we're so adamant about us being a family in this office is because there has been so many different things that we've all gone through, not just this year. I mean, every year that we've been yes. open, there has been yes. stuff going on. Yes. And so there's been times where we have had to like have a office wide a crying session or yes. we're going to go yes. out and eat or yes. maybe we need to go get a drink <laughs> yes <laughs> or maybe we need to close the office and drink in the office like yes. it's, it's whatever <laughs> it, it, is. it is what it is you know the i know the beginning years were definitely rough on dr jones and rough on dr strickland but we wanted to make sure that we always supported them i remember there were times where like but well, we don't know this and i said well i'm gonna be at work <laughs> this is what time I'm be here from this time to this time. We got this together. Look, don't go good enough emotional <laughs> on episode one. Now. Right, Come on. right. You have us crying and we all sound like we got thumps in our throat. Hey, <laughs> tears are just salt water. It's okay. It's, it's okay. But I mean, when y'all say that, that's important because sometimes that is why we keep so much stress in our bodies is because we're not even releasing it. We don't have a healthy outlet for it. And you know what? I definitely agree with you. But you know, the the other piece to that, though, is people a lot of times people don't even know that they're stressed. Yeah, there were plenty of times when we after we opened our office, I would be so drained. Like I remember my parents told me, you just need to go to sleep. (laughs) Go lay down. You need yeah. Mm. go lay down. Go take a nap. (laughs) Because there are times that they would they would notice I was stressed. Yeah. I didn't even notice that I was stressed. Yeah, because that was your normal. Exactly. We're so and one the other thing is we're so used to uh, performing on one hundred because we've been professional students all our lives and we're always on the go and we're having to do so many things at one time that when we slow down. Well, I know when Doctor when we talked, all of us talked. We've always said. I feel like I'm supposed to be doing something else. <laughs> oh my gosh. The grind culture in oh American gosh. culture is sickening. 
on, on some levels, you know, the feeling that you always have to be hustling and doing something and that if you're resting, then you're being lazy. Oh, gosh. Because you know? I certainly feel that way. Rest is necessary, though. It, Your body will not make it if you don't have moments of rest. It's, that's not how we were built. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And the thing is, I think we've been so conditioned from, well, I'll say the African-American culture. We've been so conditioned to ignore what is going on for the sake of being strong. And I'm doing my air quotes, being strong. <laughs> you know, we think that in order to be strong, we have to ignore what's what's going on with us. And which, endure. It, it, yes, and endure. And that's why a lot of us, we start suffering physically and internally because we're not paying attention to our body. We don't pay attention to the fact that we have a headache. So your blood pressure may be up or you may be hydrated or you need to sit down somewhere. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't pay attention to those. Yeah, I you know, example from my own life. This is Dr. Wall, by the way. <laughs> example from my own life. I remember in my undergrad uh, program that I was in, it was a fast track program. So mm-hmm. every semester I had to take 21 hours. Mm-hmm. I remember I was working five jobs. I was taking 21 hours. I was a captain of the step team. I was doing all this kind of stuff. So when I got to the end of first semester, I completely crashed. Like I, my kidneys didn't work properly. Mm, I ended mm. up passing out mm. in um, the shower. And my roommate at the time, which was, you know, Trish, y'all mm-hmm. know her. She had to like call my mom and had to come get me. And I'm like, oh, wow. why am I putting myself through this? Mm-hmm. It's We have this thing where we have to be perfect. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And have to have straight A's, have to do. And I'm like, who made th- in my clients on this, I always say, who made these rules? And yeah. because I always say that to myself now, because of that incident, it's like you have permission to change it up. The The goal is to get it done, not to get it done one specific way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember I have an example kind of similar to yours. I remember when we graduated with our doctorate degree in 2011, I was so. During my doctorate program, I was working five or six jobs as well. (laughs) And I remember when I got my first job after we graduated, I was so used to being on set on go that I would finish my work by, I would say, three o'clock. Now, mind you, I don't get off work until five. I would finish my and you, <laughs> do you know have what I would else even, for me to do <laughs> exactly I, and actually I want to say I would finish earlier because after that I would go and just mess with my coworkers and sit in their office they'd be like Dr. Jones I got to do my work what are you doing how mm. are you finished and I remember one of my girlfriends telling me Lafanya you don't have to keep grinding like you like that you can take your time you can stretch out your work now but we because when you go to school all your life and you're in bachelor's degree programs and master's programs and doctoral programs, you're programmed to be organized, mm-hmm. structured and get your work done because you have, especially when you get, well, I don't want to say especially, but I'll say it, especially when you get to higher degrees because you, you have to work so many jobs to make ends meet. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I think also is kind of, something that we've talked about earlier is what we've visualized growing up, you mm-hmm. know, on how our parents processed their stress, how they processed work ethic um, and, you know, displayed those behaviors to us, especially if, you know, our parents were ones that pushed for high achievement and, you know, had an expectation for performance that that kind of instills in you that whole mindset of go, 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 go. And, you know, achieve, 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 achieve. Yeah. And that, you know, I can handle everything. You know, I can, they did it. So why can't I do it? Yeah. Fear yeah. of failure is real. It is. And, you know, when you get older and you start really thinking about things, you realize that failure is okay. Like it's when you quit and you don't ever pick yourself back up that that becomes a problem. But failure is part of the journey. Success comes from failure. Exactly. Absolutely. Multiple failures <laughs> yes. over and over again. Over. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Yes. And, and so I definitely agree that it's a gen. I don't want to say generational thing, but it is a learned behavior mm-hmm. in some ways. Absolutely. 
Yeah. So, it, so in order for us to be able to handle our stress well, we have to be able to develop better habits. We have to be able to develop the ability to acknowledge when we're stressed out. Mm-hmm. And, and sometimes, yes, you, it may be more than one thing that you're stressed out about. But the, the point is to identify those things that you're stressed out about and prioritize. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And one thing that, you know, I want to kind of add there is stress is not always a bad thing. So, you know, a little bit earlier, I was talking about you stress, you know, if now I'm going to go ahead and put this disclaimer out there f- for everybody <laughs> for future podcast episodes. Uh, I'm really into astrophysics and quantum mechanics and like evolutionary <laughs> stuff. So if I bring that up, <laughs> you've been forewarned. And she's a conspiracy theorist. Oh, yeah. Uh, now, that's like five podcasts in itself. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one thing I wanted to say, like from an evolutionary standpoint, stress serves a purpose. You know, that is the reason that our body is alarmed to let us know that something is not going according to plan. So stress is also, let's say you're getting ready to walk across the street and you look to see if a car is coming. Stress is what keeps you from walking out into the street so Mm -hmm. that you don't get hit by a car. You know, there's an alertness factor that comes along with that. But stress, when it's taken to the extreme, you know, causes all of the things that you were talking about earlier, you know, all of the physical uh, ailments that sometimes we think are just either genetic or um, due to bad habits. I mean, in some way, they're definitely due to bad habits. But, um, you know, it's a, a lack of follow through with taking stock of what's really going on with you internally, mm-hmm. because we don't know the words a lot of times for identifying what it is we're actually feeling. So we go with I'm mad or I'm frustrated or I'm sad when in actuality that feeling may be a little bit more nuanced than that. So it could be I'm feeling rejected Mm -hmm. or I'm feeling lonely or um, unheard Mm -hmm. or underappreciated. But what we're doing is kind of creating this huge melting pot of all of these feelings. So they get really confused and boom, they just come out as this one thing. Mm hmm. Yeah, I think a lot of people wouldn't understand that by the terms fight or flight. Yeah. Um, that's, that's the stress response. But when we really think about it, it's more than just that. You have fight, flight, freeze, fawn. You have different things Mm -hmm. that our body naturally reacts to. And depending on the circumstances, that's going to be the one you need to choose. But you can't stay in that mode because your body will deteriorate. Well, if and that's the thing, if you stay in the fight mode, that's when anxiety increases mm-hmm. because you're, yeah. you cannot function at yeah. that level of intensity without your body beginning to become immune and then adjusting, which then creates that anxiety. Mm-hmm. And I think the um, the more your body adjusts to it, the higher your threshold for stress starts to get. Yeah. So in our field, there's something called general adaptive syndrome or gas And that is when you allow your body to maintain a certain level of stress for so long that it has become your new baseline for stress. So then in order for you to actually feel stress, something even more intense needs to happen. And if Mm -hmm. you stay at that level for a long period of time, you never go back down to the original level. Mm -hmm. You've now brought that level up to the new higher level. And then it just keeps going up from there and there and there. And then again, you know, comes all of these other panic, uh, panic attacks. And so people start thinking that they're having heart attacks and you go, which you should still go to the doctor, please don't do that don't stop but go to the doctor to make sure Mm -hmm. but as dr strickland was saying as you continue to increase you start having panic attacks and so you have to learn how to come down from those uh, flight of fight modes so that you can begin to get in the rest mode yeah sometimes you do have to retrain yourself if if that is left there are so many different things that will end up happening to your body you know you have what we call biopsychosocial you know that's your biology that's your mentality that's your environment you know it's it's a multitude of different things 
that end up happening. You know, we talked about anxiety, but you also have other issues that end up happening like depression, like the flight tends to be the depression. Um, (laughs) You end up having personality changes. We see people who are angry all the time. There are physical symptoms that end up popping up. You see um, changes in women's menstrual cycles. Eating habits. Eating habits, which can result in eating disorders. You end up having stomach issues, ulcers. You know, our bodies are meant to work with our minds and our psyches. Like all of that goes together. So you can't do this for an extended amount of time and then not correct it and expect your body to function properly. It won't, it will shut down and you'll be looking at me looking like me freshman year in the bathtub Mm -hmm. in the floor. That's just not, that's not a good look. (laughs) Don't do it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. You do not want to get to that point because then at that point it's like you've, you've, you've now created more diagnoses. Not mm-hmm. only are, is your mental health diagnoses important. Now you have physical symptoms that's going to also exacerbate yeah. your mental health diagnoses. Exactly. Like oh, another yeah. one that I forgot to mention was you end up having skin and hair problems. Yes. My, yeah. my mom is a hairdresser. Um, has been one for years. There's so many women that come to her and their hair is falling out because they're stressed out over something ridiculous. Also with me being the sex therapist, you end up having sexual dysfunction. Like your body for women, your body may not lubricate properly, or you may not be able to orgasm. Men may not be able to have an erection. These are things that your body, these are signs that your body is not properly working. Mm -hmm. So just to put this little uh, disclaimer there, if you are experiencing any of those things, one first go to the doctor go to your PCP to get checked out to make sure everything is functioning. And if that's, if everything is okay, then two, go to a mental health provider in your local area so that you can work through this stress. You know, we are here to help people process through process through the stress that you are experiencing because we know it's a lot it's a lot for us and if we if we weren't in the positions that we are in now we would we can't truly say that we would necessarily know when because we don't know now yeah. I, I let me just cut that out we don't know now we Dr. just hold Strickland, each other accountable yes i would just thank you <laughs> thank you because i was getting ready to yes. say a whole different sentence but you said it summed it up thank yeah. you <laughs> yeah it's, like I was saying earlier, it's been a rough year. So we have been on each other's cases about, did you get enough sleep? Did the doctor say you could come out? Uh, yes. What'd your husband say? What this, like we, you have to have um, a tribe, a support system. Yes. This is, we are not supposed to be doing life by ourselves. And trust me, I'm a whole introvert. And I don't like people like that all the time, but (laughs) I know that I need a tribe. I need a support system. You need people that you can lean on, whether it's friends and family or if it is a professional, because sometimes professionals, you can lean on them better because you know that they're only there to help you. They're not asking anything of you. They're neutral. Yeah. Oh, real. We are neutral. (laughs) (laughs) Those people. Yes. (laughs) I agree. You know, I think some other things that, you know, we can do to kind of start dealing with some of the stress that we experience is one kind of figuring out where the sources of stress are. So is it work stress? Is it home stress? Is it marital stress? Is it medical stress? Is it uh, parent child stress? Money. Um, Money. (laughs) Which is probably a big one for all of us right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. That'll cloud your judgment, you know, and. One thing is kind of thinking about, are you living in survival mode? Just when you think that kind of keyed me in when you said money, Mm -hmm. you know, are you living from a a place of just surviving? And that is a whole nother beast in and of itself. Yeah, It's levels. Yes. Because it will cloud your judgment on pretty much everything because your only focus will be on survival. And sometimes that can lead you to make decisions that are extremely unhealthy for yourself Mm -hmm. because, Again, you know, it's like when you back the dog into the corner and they're, you know, oh, yeah, I want to pop off. Exactly. 
you know, and it's almost like, oh, well, I've kind of sometimes based off choices, we've backed ourselves into corner <laughs> or external circumstances have backed us into a corner. And then we just come out swinging and not paying attention to how we're handling these situations. And it ends up mm-hmm. causing more disaster that needs a whole lot more correction later on. Yeah. I tell my clients that there's three different levels of living. Well, three different levels of existence. So you have surviving, you have living, and then you have thriving. The mm-hmm. goal is to eventually get to thriving. But mm-hmm. the honest truth is most of us stay in surviving for yeah. the majority of our lives and may get to living. Yeah. Uh, For the African American community, we have learned how to survive in that mentality of surviving Mm -hmm. and confuse ourselves into thinking that we're living. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's nothing wrong with being resilient. Of course, we are notorious for turning lemons into lemonade. But Mm -hmm. there does come a time where you just need to have lemonade from the start and not have to turn it in to anything. Yeah. I think that's a good point. Mm hmm. If you haven't heard about Anchor, it's the easiest way to make a podcast. Let me explain. It's free. There are certain tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. That's A-N-C-H-O-R period F-M. Another thing that I was thinking that we could kind of explore as well is the how do you deal with stress? And I, I think we can break that up into a couple of different ways. You can break it up into things that you can do, you know, with others, things that you can do internally, and then just some general kind of health and wellness stuff. And one of the more action oriented types of uh, stress reduction techniques, I guess, would be, you know, how to deal with other people. So Mm -hmm. sometimes we have a problem saying no. Oh, Mm. yeah. (laughs) See? Oh, yeah. See, I just said, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. You know, saying yes all the time and accepting on projects and not knowing how to tell another person in a respectful way. Mm -hmm. uh, And I'm going to decline your request for me to do this activity, you know, leads to a whole different set of stresses. So the art of learning how to say no. Well, and one of the things that I tell my clients is to instead of saying immediately saying yes, say let me think about that or let me get back to you. That way you're not committed to something and you can process what they're asking you to do, figure out how much time it's going to take out of your day, out of your time, and then go back and give them a response. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of the reasons why people have a hard time saying no is one, because they think it makes them look aggressive um, or mean. Mm hmm. Um, and you know, not realizing that, yeah, you can say no and you can still be just as nice and polite as you yep. generally are in any other setting. No is a complete sentence. Yeah. It is. I, I definitely think, especially in America, cause that's where we live, that people have a tendency to have poor boundaries. Oh, God. it's like yes. you can just walk all over anybody and it's, it's just not appropriate. So you being able to say no is important because if you say yes, to that, then that means you had to say no to probably something that was very important to you. Absolutely. That's true. Yeah. And I'm going to reiterate, no is a complete sentence. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I, I would like to uh, expand on boundaries, but I know that's a whole different topic, but we're going to come back. So boundaries to be continued. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> because they really are important. And just to, I don't want to heart, like you said, I don't want to stay on boundaries too long, but it's not being used in an effort to control, you know, yes. it's more about yes. self-preservation and mm-hmm. taking care of self versus trying to control other people. 
You know, that is part of stress reduction. One of the reasons why you feel that way is because you don't have clear boundaries with the people around you. And when you set those, you're able to finally feel more in control of yourself. Yes. Yeah. And free. And, yeah, and I'm going to add one more thing and I will stop talking about boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> so even if you're one of those people who you have been practicing on having healthy boundaries and, you know, you've been actually being assertive and things like that, which we'll go over in just a second. That doesn't mean that the person that you're being assertive with or setting boundaries with have good boundaries because you can have good yeah. boundaries, but then the person that you're associating with, communicating with, they can be ones who don't accept your boundaries. So they don't set you, they don't respect your limits. And so that's how you can also feel stressed out because they're not respecting your limits and you don't know what to do. Absolutely. Uh, I think another thing that can go along with being able to f reduce stress from an kind of, like I said, an action kind of way is knowing how to prioritize. You yeah. know, we, mm -hmm. I talk with clients all the time about there's n not multiple number ones. Oh, you know, everything no. can't be, a priority. yeah, everything can't be number one. Um, because then you have no way of knowing where to split your time and how to, how much emphasis to give to each thing and where to focus. So learning how to put things in their respective kind of areas. And is this something I need to do now because it's urgent and it's important? Is this something that I need to delegate to someone else because it is urgent, but not necessarily that important. And I, you know, so I can delegate it to someone else. Is it something that I need to plan mm -hmm. because it's not necessarily important or, you know, quite urgent so I can plan it for another time? Or is it something you really don't need to do at all? And you're just giving it energy for no reason, yeah. you know? And like Dr. Wall was saying earlier, it's okay for you to meet your goals and set goals and meet them, but it doesn't mean that all of your goals have to be completed in one day. Yeah. It's okay for you to stretch them out for a week, a month, a year, however it needs to be stretched out. That way you don't feel so overwhelmed and feeling like those expectations that you set for yourself have to be met in one day. Yeah, there's something, uh, a link to a document that we will include in the show notes that gives you a way to prioritize your tasks, whether they are daily or weekly or monthly. Um, it's something that I use a lot with my clients on, on tasks that are high effort versus high value. Um, so, you know, the more, the higher the effort and the higher the value, the sooner that task would need to be completed, the lower the effort and the lower the value. Um, of course, you're going to want to make that uh, a lower list or lower on the totem pole, as they would say. Um, so we'll link that in the show notes so that you can have a way to kind of practice that uh, later on. Yeah. And then to add to that, I'm sorry, Dr. Wall, did we no, were, okay. go ahead. To add to that, uh, those expectations, those expectations that you have for yourself, you have to determine whether or not those are your expectations or if there are expectations that belong to someone else, because a lot of times when we have all of these to do lists or number ones, as Dr. Strickland was saying, though, some of those number ones are expectations from other people. And when we can start going through our lives and, de and determining what does not belong to us, what is not our own expectation, it can also decrease your stress. Uh, absolutely. You know, I, I, and I think that begins with communication. Yes. You know, and uh, that, of course, goes with part of setting boundaries, but being able to communicate your wants, your needs and, you know, the things that you feel uncomfortable with and like, hey, you know, I'm not sure this is something that I want to do or if this is something that I was anticipating doing. Yes. You know, I, I believe that being able to say that to somebody creates a, a a tighter bond between you and that person mm -hmm. because they can see like oh I, well she respects herself she respects me yeah. and being able to mm, I hate saying set boundaries because that's how we're trying not to focus too much on boundaries <laughs> set limits. but that's set limits <laughs> yeah you know and being able to set a limit with a person it helps you with re refocusing it helps you with 
keeping yourself from getting kind of mushrooming things out of control. Cause you know, we have a tendency to like put everything in our mind and it just kind of mushroom clouds and just grows and grows and grows and grows and grows. Mm-hmm. And grows. But yeah. being able to communicate, like I need help. Yes. I can't do all of this by myself. I know you wanted me to do a, B, C and D, but I need you to take D off my plate for me. Yeah. yeah. I got a, B and C done, but D is going to take, or I either need you to take it or I need help with it. You know, one of the, one of the things that I remember Dr. Strickland telling me a long time ago as when we were having a conversation is that she doesn't, she tries to teach her uh, clients to take the help word out of ho- out of their vocabulary, especially yeah. when it's uh, when it comes to a spousal uh, relationship. She tries to get them to take help out of their, their vocabulary because that implements that or implies that it was my job to do. And you didn't have to do it in the first place. I just need your help this time to help me wash the dishes. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wash them any other time. Yeah. And I thought that was profound. Thank you. (laughs) I try. I stole it. And I use it with my couples too. I try. Me too. (laughs) And I think that kind of is a throwback to what we were saying earlier about being able to have a group and, you know, bounce ideas off one another because that's something that's stress when working with a client. I don't know what to do. I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. You know, they're presenting me with this issue that I have no idea or they're looking at me and they're expecting like, so what's your answer? And and we look at them back and say, (laughs) what's your answer? (laughs) Yes. But I think being able to, you know, consult with one another and talk to each other and find different ideas, you know, so that I don't have to feel as, stressed out in my sessions that I don't know how to work with this particular issue with this client, but I have colleagues that do so I can go to them. And then when I'm ready to get back with that, uh, that client that, you know, presented me with that thing, I can talk to them about, okay, so, you know, last week when you said, Mm -hmm. and that goes back to what you said, let me think about that. You know, can I get back with you? So then you can always go back and say, you know, last week we talked about this thing, Mm -hmm. you know, here is a way that you can deal with it. You know, this might be an easier way to handle that situation or an alternative way to handle that situation. Most definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Another major part of, you know, managing your stress and dealing with it is to know what coping skills are going to benefit you and work best for you. And a lot of people tend to only do distraction uh, coping skills, which is good in the, in the beginning, but it's not going to allow you to fix the problem or deal with the issue that you're trying to find a solution for. So, you know, there are some different types of coping skills. You know, one is distraction. The other is grounding where you are able to kind of pull yourself out of the clouds. That's the analogy that I like to use. Uh, you tend to use deep breathing and things of that nature. You also have an emotional release that could be exercise. That could be um, if you like spoken word and getting out that way. It just kind of depends. Can I add something yeah, to yeah. that one? So th- the one thing that I try to get my clients to understand is that when you're stressed out, you can't, you can't run away from that feeling. You have a, a lot of people tend to think that they start out with the stress. No, it's something under that. It's a primary emotion right there. And could it, could it end up being stressed? Yes, but there's a primary emotion that mm-hmm. you have to deal with, whether it's hurt, rejection, abandonment, you know, the sadness, you have to deal with that emotion. And a lot of us, we, try to run from that primary emotion because it's uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. But if you would just allow yourself to process that, that primary emotion, you, you can get through it and it won't be a distraction. Yeah. Or you won't have to use something as a distraction. You Mm -hmm. can actually deal with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, The other ones, uh, coping skills are self love. And that's going to be, you know, your typical things where you get to dote on yourself. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it's you took a, a long bath this one day, or maybe you went and got a massage because massages are good to release tension in your body. Yeah. The next one is thought challenge in thought challenge. You're trying to see the proof for what you're actually thinking. You want to prove or disprove your thoughts. Yeah. If there is not physical evidence that that is going on, then more than likely it is not. Mm-hmm. So what I tell my clients to do is to take an old school snapshot or Polaroid or whatever you want to call it. And if you can't see it, it's not happening. 
Mm-hmm. All the rest of that stuff is what you emotionally put into that situation or you irrationally thought about it. You can only go off of what you see. Facts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Use facts. <laughs> Something that I say kind of in that vein with my clients is, um, you know, is this thought based in reality or is it based off your perception? Mm. And I, I also tell them that just because you think, think something or feel something doesn't mean it's true. Oh, it is a hundred. Per- <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I can't tell you how many times I say this. Yes, in a week. me too. It is real. 100%. Everything that you feel and think it is real, but it is not always true. Yeah. Yes. So you have to check yourself. Is this based off facts or is this based off what I'm feeling? And if it's based off facts, then you deal with whatever that particular situation and mm-hmm. you move forward there. But if it's based off feeling, then we got a whole nother set yeah. of things that, you know, we kind of have to start working ourselves through. And then, oh, I'm sorry. No. Oh, the other thing that I was going to um, piggyback off of Dr. Wall is something um, I, when I'm talking about coping skills with my client, I like to break it up into functional versus indulgent self-care. Mm-hmm. Um, so indulgent self-care would be things like going shopping, going mm-hmm. out and hanging out with friends or for happy hour, or getting your nails done, your hair done, a massage, things like that. And then you have functional self-care, mm-hmm. which may mean going to the doctor or crying or, you know, that could be you haven't gotten your car fixed. So you need to go take your car to the shop. You know, you've just yeah. let so many different things in your life go that you're not functioning at a level that is healthy for yourself anymore. So you have to take care of some of those very practical things. So when you're trying to cope with life, get a little bit of both of those. Yeah. Yeah. I think also something to piggyback off of Dr. Strickland is when you are thinking about different things, the reason why that snapshot is so important is because we allow our experiences from the past to fill in the holes in whatever story is taking place in front of us. Mm -hmm. And that's not factual. Mm -hmm. It's not. It creates that (laughs) fight or flight mode for all of us because it's like, okay, I got to figure this out. Okay, I got to do this or no, I got to run from it. But Sometimes you need to just take a moment and look at it, sit in it, and not be afraid of yourself because you, I mean, you can't run from yourself, even though all of us try to do that. And then process what's going on and come to a conclusion. A lot of us are not doing that. You know, you have to learn how to take responsibility for your part in your stress. Because if you're not taking responsibility for your part in your stress, then it's going to be difficult for you to apply these coping skills because you don't know <laughs> which one belongs to what. Yeah, it'll feel like life is happening to you yes. versus you being an active participant in your own life. Yes. Yeah. In in therapy, what I always tell my clients, and they probably can't stand me half the time. I'm like, so how's that working for you? That's what you thought you should have <laughs> did. Yeah. That's what we doing today. So they, they, we end up having a really good bond. But I know that when I say that, they're like, oh my God, here she go. Okay. Mm-hmm. I, I did something crazy. Yes, you did. And I'm calling you out. Mm-hmm. Um, the final coping skill is access your higher self. Now, most of us cannot really get to that until we're like trained well. Yeah. So accessing your higher self is the giving back to um, your community or to the people around you or that sort of thing. So people go and do soup kitchens because that that does it gets you off oh, yeah. of what you're dealing with and you're giving back to someone else. And you're like, OK, maybe my problems aren't as big as I really think they are. I, it, it helps you conceptualize it better. Yeah. Something I do with my clients in session sometimes is we do what's called. And uh, if you're listening, Jackie Todd, uh, I got this <laughs> exercise from you. Uh, fellow therapist yes uh it's something called the healthy me activity and earlier you were talking about biopsychosocial so Mm -hmm. what i usually add on to that um depends upon the person's age so for uh, teens and college age i'll add academic but for uh you know working individuals i'll say occupational so i usually will have them go through uh bio biological or physical uh issues psychological slash mental social so relationships things like that i do spiritual Mm -hmm. slash religious depending upon that person and then we either do academic or occupational um and i explain to them that those five areas essentially make you up as an individual so what is the healthy version Mm -hmm. of you in all of those areas so when i say biological what does a 
physically healthy version of you look like? And then we just break that down. What does your sleep look like? What does your eat, eating look like? What does your yeah. sex life look like? What does um your, you know, medical issues, if you have any, what does that look mm-hmm. like if you have chronic pain? So what is a manageable level of, of pain for you? Um, and then we go to psychological. Okay. So how are you processing your, uh, emotions? How are you communicating your, uh, feelings? Are you acknowledging and honoring what you actually feel? Um, are you confronting any past pains and traumas that you've got going on? Then we move over into social. What does that look like for you in a healthy way? How many friends do you, you know, would you feel is ideal? What looks like a good time for you? What is the quality of your relationships with your family, your, um, your friends? And then of course, spiritual. And what kind of keyed me in is when you were talking about like volunteering and going yeah. to soup kitchens. Um, I focus on what is your passion? So for our religious folks, we kind of go that route. But for the spiritual, like what is a passion project for you? Mm -hmm. Are you passionate about helping the homeless? Or are you passionate about animal rights? Or um, like in today's time, you know, Black Lives Matter. So what is something that you can really focus on and gives you a sense of drive and purpose? And then we, the last part is either academic or occupational. So like, what is your ultimate career goal? Are you doing what you said you wanted to do? Mm -hmm. You know, are you in the career Mm -hmm. that you thought you would be in when you were a kid? So we take all of those areas and we start identifying like what is missing so that you can see, oh, well, I'm stressed about this because I'm not in the career that I I wanted to be. uh, I don't know, an astronaut, but (laughs) I'm, you know, working in. I don't know. Home Depot. Right. (laughs) But then that that's where those expectation challenges come in, because was it was it your expectation to become an astronaut or was it your parents expectation for you to become an astronaut? And if it has now changed over to yours, how how did it how did that happen? Yeah, absolutely. And then just to add on to the spiritual and religious sector, uh, as coping skills, obviously, if you are a spiritual person, then you know to pray, you know to read your Bible, you know to have that meditation time so that you can have time with God to guide you and lead you so that you can seek, so that you can have that direction from Him on a daily basis. Okay, guys. So I just wanted to remind everyone um, that I will be, well, I, we will be placing a uh, document in the show notes that goes over ways to prioritize tasks into what you should do now versus later or things that you can delegate to others. So just wanted to let you know to check that out uh, if you were interested. Also, if you are looking for a therapist in your region or your area, a resource is to go to psychology today. We um, use that a lot with our clients and different people who are looking for different types of therapy because you are going to be able to do a search engine in that search engine. You can put in your zip code. You can put in what type of therapist you're looking for, what their specialties are. And that is just so beneficial. And another way to find mental health providers is through your insurance. A lot of people don't know that they have an EAP program that they can go through. So call your insurance company and ask or actually contact your human resources department and ask for your EAP number. That way you can give them a call as well to find a mental health provider in your area or in your network. So, okay, interns, process your notes. Be sure to catch us next session and find us on all major platforms at The Recycled Podcast. If you're a new intern, be sure to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Thanks for listening. And remember, we are shifting and reshaping our psyche through healing conversations and connections, one discussion at a time.